Good morning. Welcome to everybody here today, to the Foster family, of course, the extended family, the survivor community, friends, supporters, dignitaries, everybody who is here. My name is John Fain. It's my absolute honour to have been invited by Chrissy to look after you all here today. I want first to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nation on whose land we gather, and I'd like to pay my respect to their elders, past and present. Anthony's sudden death has reminded us that we hang by a fragile thread. None of us know what will happen in our lives tomorrow. Upon the news becoming public that Anthony had so suddenly, so cruelly, so shockingly, so unjustly died, I received any number of pieces of correspondence and I want to read but one of them to you to get proceedings underway today. Upon receiving this email, for reasons that will become clear, I wrote back to its author and said, are you happy for this information to be made public? I can guarantee you anonymity. My correspondent wrote back and said, no, I don't want anonymity. I want my name read out. I want my story told. Patrick from Geelong writes, I'm a survivor of clergy abuse pretty much from my first day at school as a five-year-old in 1970 until I was 16 in 1981 when I decided to fight back. It's been a difficult journey and I kept the abuse hidden until 2011 when journalists published an article exposing my living abuser and there he was, a picture of him on the front page of the paper. Cut, to cut a long story short, I spoke to the journalists. They put me in touch with Victoria Police and by joining with others, my abuser was jailed. He will be released in a few weeks. I will continue to live with PTSD, depression and anxiety. Pretty much all that I went through has been accepted as true and validated by the courts and the Melbourne response team. But I'd like to ask you a very small favour. If you're attending Anthony's memorial service, or if not, when you see Chrissy, can you please thank her for the strength, perseverance, advocacy, and inspiration that without ever even meeting me, she and Anthony gave to me. During the most difficult parts of the trial, it was their faces, their voices, that would offer quiet encouragement. They were, and Chrissy will continue to be, my unconscious mentors. And my heart skipped a beat when I heard of Anthony's death last week from Patrick in Geelong. So we're gathered here for a ritual, and ritual's important. The paradox is, that for so long it's been the world's religions that have tried to monopolise ritual. Our gathering here today is evidence that monopolies usually fail. It's the quiet and dignified persistence of the Fosters that undid all the victim blaming, that for so many of the defenders of the indefensible was their default response. So many people with legitimate complaints for decades were bullied and brushed aside, monstered by legions of lawyers and occasionally compliant and even corrupt police. But so many of you in this hall today and watching on television and listening on radios, you've joined together and brought that to an end. We salute you. Every now and again, a remarkable individual is thrown within history's grasp. Often, there's no deliberation, no inkling of what they've started. Rosie Batty, Eddie Marbo, 
in telling stories, I'd say John Clarke. Anthony and Chrissy Foster as well. What a formidable team. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll hear from many people and many facets of this remarkable man. But first, could I ask you, please all be upstanding for the National Anthem. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I invite Anthony's brother and sister, Brian Foster and Carol Burkhardt, to offer the opening tribute. Brian and Carol, please. Premier, <clears throat> dignitaries, family, friends, and those that did not know Anthony personally, but have come today to give their thanks for his life. Thank you all for being here. The family is honoured that Anthony has been given a state funeral, and we think it fitting. We have received so many messages, letters, support, and we thank everyone for their kindness. Let me tell you a bit about Anthony's life. Our parents, Ken and Joyce, migrated from England in 1950 with Carol and myself. Anthony was born at Oakley Community Hospital three years later. He lived his whole life in Oakley District or they also travelled the world. Carol was eight years older, and I am six years older than Anthony. We remember him as a sweet child, loving, caring. One of his earliest hobbies was being involved in the Scouts. Dad had been in the Scouts movement in England and encouraged Anthony to join. Anthony progressed to Queen's Scout level supported by Dad, who joined as a scout leader. Carol and I moved away from home reasonably early in our lives. Anthony filled the voids left by our departures and was close to both of our parents. He was a keen student, educated at Bayview Primary and Waverley High School. After finishing high school, he went on to study surveying at RMIT. As a young man, Anthony learned to fly planes and eventually obtained a commercial pilot's license. One of his first flying jobs was transporting crayfish from King Island to the mainland. Of this, the family tells a story that will give you some idea of Anthony's dry wit. One day he was hauling a load of live crayfish. Overlooking the ocean, Anthony turned to his pilot, co-pilot, John Davies, 
with a cheeky grin and observed that if the plane crashed, the news head newspaper headlines would read, plane crash, two fatalities, 300 survivors. <laughs> Our father had a small business <coughs> excuse me, called Ken Foster Heating. In 1975, at the age of 22, Anthony had to decide what profession to pursue. He decided to join our father in the family business and continue studying on the side, learning about heating and ventilating, ventilation at RMIT. Five years later, Anthony met Chrissy, who would be the love of his life. Chrissy was going out with one of Anthony's flying acquaintances when they first met. She went to her boyfriend's house, but he wasn't there. Instead, Anthony came to the door. They chatted briefly and immediately liked each other. When they next, next met at a leap year party soon after, both were single. They talked all night and fell in love and married within five months. Anthony wore a red bow tie at the wedding. There was no happier husband and man anywhere. Soon they would have three beautiful daughters. Emma, Katie, and Amy. Anthony and Dad worked side by side until Dad retired in 1983. The business with it was then renamed Foster Hydronic Heating, and Anthony continually expanded it, its operations for the next three decades. He had an interest in electronics and once built a computer from scratch to make quoting easier. He also started a small business with a colleague building antennas for the emerging CB radio business. But the heating business was his main focus. Locals who drive regularly along Princess Highway through Oakley and Murrumbina will still be able to tell you where to find Foster Hydronic Heating. It became iconic, although Anthony sold, Anthony sold the business in 2011. Beside electronics, Anthony had many in interests and embraced these with his usual passion. They included billiards, photography, Victorian homes, cars, boats, and flying. He was involved with Rotary and was a past president of the Rotary Club of Oakley. He was also a member of the Master Plumbers Association. However, he loved nothing more than being a father, and most recently a grandfather. Anthony and Chrissy were wonderful parents. Theirs was an all-encompassing relationship based on ba great love and support that they provided to each other. It was this great love and support that enabled them to manage the pain of the tragedy that followed. Anthony's greatest achievement outside his family became his campaign to expose child sex abuse and cover-ups, initially in the Catholic Church and later in wider areas of our community. To this he dedicated the final 21 years of his life. This is his legacy. In pursuing justice, the personal costs to Anthony and Chrissy have been enormous. The benefits to the Australian community will be great and enduring. Dear brother, we're immensely proud of you. Rest in peace. Thank you to Brian and Carol. And I now invite the Honourable Daniel Andrews, the Premier of Victoria, who offered the family this state funeral to come to the lectern to pay tribute. The Premier.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can I begin my remarks by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land and pay my deep personal respects to their elders past and present, to the Foster family and to each and every one of you who have come here today to pay tribute to such a significant Victorian and Australian. Grace. It's a singular word in the Christian tradition. Grace is generous. Grace is kind. And grace recognises no class or caste. Grace, it is said, is love that cares and rescues. It is a word that finds its foundations in Christianity. But standing here today, friends, I can think of no finer example of grace, of a man who loved and cared and rescued than Anthony Foster. I met Anthony and Chrissy only a handful of times, and it always was Anthony and Chrissy, always together, never one without the other. But every time I was with them, their integrity, their strength, their grace was apparent to me. What was also very clear was their extraordinary courage. The Fosters had faced their own tragedy, their own unimaginable tragedy, a betrayal of trust and then a denial of truth. For years they'd fought for their girls, for the justice and the recognition that they deserved. Then, remarkably, despite everything they'd endured themselves, the Fosters dedicated their lives to fighting on behalf of every other victim too. As Anthony said as part of Victoria's parliamentary inquiry, in the most personal sense, his and Chrissy's efforts were futile. They could not bring Emma back or heal Katie's injuries. But it wasn't just about them. It was never just about them. The Fosters were fighting for every childhood that had been taken and for every family that had been broken. While perpetrators and their protectors continued to deny and hide, and long before any Royal Commission or any parliamentary inquiry, Anthony and Chrissy shone a powerful light on one of our darkest chapters. It's hard to comprehend everything they faced. The suppression, the deception, the isolation. Indeed, never have those who were owed so much been given so little. And never have so much been asked of those who had already lost so deeply. But together, the Fosters defied that culture of silence. They challenged those who sought to hide the truth and those who chose to avert their gaze. And they helped transform victims into survivors, silence into justice. The Fosters always understood the power of being listened to and the power of being believed. It's why in 2012, when the Royal Commission was announced, Anthony and Chrissy made a pact to attend every session they could, to hear every victim they could. Everyone on that stand, all they'd ever seen or heard were institutions that averted their gaze. But now instead, they could look straight out into the Foster's eyes and know that they were being listened to. It was a simple act, but a profound one too. And I think it says much about the man that Anthony was. And while he has left us too soon, Anthony leaves behind a lasting legacy. Because of Anthony, a terrible evil has at long last been recognised. Because of Anthony, victims are now finally being heard. And because of Anthony, this nation and this state are fundamentally changed forever. 
Katie, Amy, Chrissy, to your loved ones, I'm, I'm so very sorry. But there's nothing that I can say to make this difficult time any easier. But please know, your darling dad and your darling husband won't ever be forgotten. Just as Anthony shone a bright light in life, his legacy will continue to guide our way forward. Just as Anthony never gave up, neither will we. Thank you to Daniel Andrews, the Premier of Victoria. I now invite Alan Worthington, Anthony's friend and colleague of nearly 30 years standing, to speak, and then that will be followed by a reading by Anthony's sister-in-law, Mrs Linda Redford-Watt. Alan, Linda. Uh, all of you here today will, will know, I'm not sure whether you can hear me properly, will know about Anthony uh, for his advocacy for abuse victims, but um, not too many would know about his, uh, his working past, because a lot of that has happened since he finally was able to retire. He ran a, say, as Brian said, he ran a very successful installation business for many, many years, and uh, he employed a number of people. I started working with Anthony 14 years ago, and I guess I say with Anthony rather than for Anthony because of it, he was the sort of person that you, uh, you never felt that you were working for him. He was, uh, he was helpful, he was never overbearing. He employed, you know, he employed you because he knew you had skills. Uh, you know, other employers, I think, sort of you know, employ someone and then they sort of micromanage them, but Anthony was, was never like that. He was, a, he was a real people person and he just wanted to see people advance in life and, and help them along the way. Running the business wasn't just about money. I guess an example of this is uh, when I first started with Anthony, he had one service tech. Um, and uh, that service tech, he lost his licence for six months. Just speeding fines, I think, nothing other than that. But you know, Anthony could have easily said, well, you haven't got a licence, you can't drive, goodbye, you're going to find another job. But uh, that wasn't Anthony. He uh, could see the value in his skills. Uh, and he actually hired an apprentice to, uh, to drive him around for six months. So, I mean, the value of that was the tech was keeping his livelihood going and also the, the apprentice was learning some new, new skills. You know, Anthony could see the long-term benefits of employing people. It wasn't just a, a short-term thing. Um, I would hope that every, everyone who's worked for Anthony would, uh, would agree with me on that. Um, there's a number of people who've... Uh, who have worked for him that are now operating very successful businesses uh, and a number of them are, are here now and I'm sure that they are thankful for Anthony for giving them a start. And he was very heavily involved in industry associations, as Brian said, the, uh, the master plumbers and everything like that, because he could see the value not just in feathering his own nest but in helping the whole the industry as a whole grow and make sure that they were all skilled and, and doing it properly because that was the way uh, he wanted it. Um, he was well respected by his, uh, his peers in this industry and I know there's a few of them here today that, uh, that uh, really you know, had a lot to do with Anthony and spoke well of him and, and it's, it's great to see them here. But Anthony, as well as running a business, he was a very hands-on person. I remember the first time I met him, it was about 27 years ago, and he sort of stuck his head out from underneath the, underneath the desk because he was working on a computer. He... Um, he liked to fix his own computers. He designed his own program to um, do heat loads, did his own customer database. And uh, he always seemed to uh, be doing that sort of stuff. Uh, I learned a lot about computers and, and things like that from Anthony. Nowhere near as much as he knew, but uh, I was always uh, happy to stay behind a few later hours and, uh, and talk to him about that. And he always seemed to have a soldering iron sitting in his office because he'd make up little relays and things like that that... Uh, I know that uh, one of the things that Ivan didn't like <laughs> he used to put them in boilers because he couldn't find, you know, he couldn't find something that um, was a proprietary brand thing that 
do, do the job, he made it himself, and that was really good. And the business really had a, a family feel because um, Chrissy was working in the business and the girls would drop in and that was, you know, it just, you felt part of the family and, uh, and that was such a, uh, you know, a great thing of working with Anthony. Now, I guess in spite of everything that, uh, that Anthony and Chrissy and the family have been through, you know, he, he still kept his sense of humour, had a very good sense of humour. Well, after all, he's a Collingwood supporter, so you do need a good sense of humour, I think, don't you? But you know, uh, we're all going to miss him. He's gone way too soon. Um, but he's done so much with his life and, uh, and for others that uh, hopefully the, the legacy will live on. But uh, somebody that I certainly grew to love and I'm going to really miss his, his counsel and, uh, and, and his presence. He's just a wonderful man. A poem on Love and Loss by Alfred Lord Tennyson. I envy not in any moods the captive void of noble rage, the linnet born within the cage that never knew the summer woods. I envy not the beast that takes his license in the field of time, unfettered by the sense of crime, to whom a conscience never wakes nor what may count itself as blessed, the heart that never plighted troth, but stagnates in the weeds of sloth, nor any want-begotten rest. I hold it true, whate'er befall, I feel it when I sorrow most. Tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all.
We now have three tributes to Anthony. The first from John Van Ray, a friend of Anthony's of more than 20 years. And then Tim Seckel QC, who legally represented the Foster family, both in their civil case against the Catholic Church and in the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse. And then thirdly, this is Anne Barker, the former MP for Oakley, who took the book Hell on the Way to Heaven to Parliament, and she was the first politician to raise these matters in the Parliament to, and to call for a state-led inquiry into priest abuse. That was a request which, 12 months later, led to the Victorian Parliamentary Inquiry, which in turn helped trigger the Gillard government's decision to call the Royal Commission. So I ask you to welcome John Van Ray, Tim Seckel and Anne Barker to the microphone. Over two centuries ago, Napoleon said, put your iron hand in a velvet glove. One century ago, President Roosevelt said, speak softly and carry a big stick. Neither of those men knew Anthony Foster, a man of this century. Anthony took his iron hand of truth to the Melbourne Archdiocese, then took his big stick and brave men of Ballarat across the world to a tiny pretend nation state which conveniently provides sanctuary and diplomatic immunity for miraculously ontologically transformed men of God anointed anointed as the princes of the church. Over 20 years ago, our two worlds collided under uniquely horrible circumstances. As we all grieve along with Chrissy, Amy and Katie in these past days, some have suggested I was his wingman. Perhaps I have been their private wingman, avoiding the media. But without dispute, their public wingman is Paul Kennedy. Thank you. Your professionalism has shone over these last days. Thank you, Paul. I was in the shadows as the horrors of Emma and Katie's demons wreaked havoc whilst Amy struggled in the chaos. I walked as Bill Nelson in Chrissy and Paul's book, Hell on the Way to Heaven. Then its elevation to the Victorian Parliamentary Inquiry and Library, including the Italian version. Together, we walked through many stages of our state inquiry, resulting in the Betrayal of Trust report. When the historical Royal Commission was announced by then Prime Minister Julia Gillard, we were up and running to the Melbourne County Court. There we witnessed Justice Peter McClellan's opening address along with the seven days of case study 16. After my private session with Royal Commissioner Bob Atkinson, Chrissy and Anthony even made time to lunch with my wife, Monica, and I to debrief. Anthony was always on a serious mission, but he never took himself too seriously. It was 
a rare trait he possessed. We also enjoyed many lighter moments. On more than one occasion, we went bush dancing in a Gippsland hall to strip the willow or do a heel and toe. We even planted trees for land care. Along with another survivor and his wife, we gave Chrissy and Anthony a red oak tree that was planted in their bush haven to mark the beginning of the Royal Commission. Now Chrissy, as I approach the end of my tribute, a private confession needs to be made. Just to you, no one else is listening. <laughs> Bless me Chrissy, for I have sinned. It has been too long since my last confession. A small but growing group of individuals have seduced me. We were plotting behind your back to nominate you and Anthony for an Australian of the Year Award. We can later discuss my penance. <laughs> and for all the people eavesdropping here, due to the unforeseen change in circumstances, perhaps a nomination for Anthony in the posthumous category for 2018 should be considered. as the precedent of Eddie Marbo's award has been established. Brian Kean Cohen, who dedicated much of his career to that historic Marbo ruling, also worked with Anthony, contributing many comprehensive, solid legal submissions to our state inquiry and royal commission. Thank you, Brian. Anthony John Foster, quintessential family man, atheist and plumber, began a legacy which lifted the hopes of many devastated innocent childhoods from the deepest chasms of their humanity, given voice and wings so we can continue to fly higher than we ever dreamt. So as we bid farewell on behalf of every other man, woman and child affected by the disease of pedophilia, we say thank you. I will always cherish the moments we talked, we listened, we walked, we danced, we wrote, we toiled, we laughed, we cried, we whined, we dined, we dreamt, we flew. But most of all, mate, we lived. As eternity beckons, Anthony, leave your iron hand and big stick behind. Take your soft voice and velvet glove you deserve now to rest in peace. Thank you.
letter to Anthony. You were once a party to litigation the like of which should never have been required. An advocate for a cause that ought not require one. A kind and passionate voice for children and families wrongfully forgotten. But it should never have been so. For all it would have taken was for the institution vested with responsibility to have acted responsibly. Your qualities lie in stark contrast to those of the forces to whom you are opposed. They include integrity, humility, compassion and empathy. I am honoured to have walked with you but part of your way. Goodbye, my friend, Tim. Um, in August uh, 2010, I was invited as a state member for Oakley to attend a book launch in my local area. The book that was launched that evening was Hell on the Way to Heaven, written by Chrissy Foster and Paul Kennedy. I stood in a packed hall and listened to an amazing, strong and dignified woman speak about her and her family's suffering following the sexual abuse of two of her daughters by the parish priest during their early years of school. That amazing woman was Chrissy Foster. I took the book home that night and I started to read it. I did not stop reading until I, I had finished the book. And having read the book, I knew what I had to do. But I also knew I needed to learn a great deal more. And so began my journey with Anthony and Chrissy. The depth and breadth of their knowledge about the crime of clergy sexual abuse the barriers that were continually placed before them, internal church processes and legal impediments, their knowledge could not be surpassed. Over many months they gave me as much time as I needed with them and they were always able and prepared to provide that advice and information. I remember those discussions with Anthony very clearly. Anthony was unique. He was intelligent, knowledgeable, determined, very methodical and dignified. He spoke calmly and clearly, despite there being times when the inf information or advice he was giving me must have been renewing pain and hurt. Anthony and Chrissy fought hard and long for their daughters, their family, and they continued to fight for full justice. They saw systems that failed in so many ways that put up barriers at every opportunity and covered up crimes, crimes against children. They knew not just of their struggle to achieve justice for their daughters, but of the struggle for so many who through clergy sexual abuse had their childhood and innocence taken away from them and who continued to struggle with this into adulthood with far too many finding they could not continue that struggle into adulthood. They didn't step back from those many victims and survivors, they stepped forward. My journey with Anthony and Chrissy saw us present the book to the State Parliamentary Library in May 2011 and the announcement of the Victorian Parliamentary Inquiry into the handling of child abuse by religious and other organisations in April 2012. During that inquiry, it became clear to even more of the broader community the extent of the strength, intelligence, compassion and determination of Anthony Foster. When Anthony, Chrissy, Katie and Amy appeared before the committee, Anthony said that they wished they did not have to be there, but they refused 
to let the Catholic Church take any more children from us. He said Emma's life could not be restored and Katie's injuries healed, but he told the parliamentary committee members they could make a difference to the lives of thousands of other victims now and they could prevent the abuse of further children. I feel that Anthony and Chrissy did not see, even at that time, that their dignified, calm presence had such a powerful effect. And it was Anthony who, when he spoke publicly, reached out even more to survivors, their families and to the broader community. Anthony and Chrissy went to every hearing for the state inquiry. Whether commenting to press at hearings or catching up with survivors and their families for a chat, Anthony's leadership and compassion was clear for all to see. In July 2011 in Ireland, I met with Colm O'Gorman, a man who was abused as a child and, and as an adult, and after many years of working to reclaim his lost life, he wrote a book titled Beyond Belief. That book and Colm started the inquiries in Ireland. He told me that should our work in Victoria to bring about a statutory inquiry be successful, it would have the same effect as the first inquiry had in Ireland. Particularly once the first inquiry was called in Ireland, survivors courageously came forward and there would be no more barriers, denial, resistance or silence. But it was also the huge public and media pressure that grew to a movement that would ensure further investigations and inquiries would not stop. The public were no longer reluctant to challenge and demand answers. We had the start in Victoria. The State Parliamentary Committee conducting the inquiry worked very hard. And as they conducted the hearings, the broader community listened and watched. And they listened to and watched Anthony and Chrissy Foster. The report handed down in November 2013 titled Betrayal of Trust was certainly a landmark document and the members of parliament who conducted that inquiry and their support, their support staff are to be thanked for their investigation, research and recommendations. They are. Yeah. And with the establishment by the Commonwealth Government of the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sex Abuse in November 2012 and its work since that time, a greater breadth of community has listened and watched the Commission's work. And that greater breadth of community has listened to Anthony and watched Anthony and Chrissy Foster. Anthony and Chrissy travelled to Rome for a hearing. It was Anthony and our courageous men from Ballarat who we listened to and watched. Anthony would have, I feel, not recognised just how much his leadership, his dignity and determination shone through, and just how much that leadership, dignity and determination ensured that the Victorian State Inquiry and the Royal Commission were established and undertaken, and that a much, much broader community of men and women are also now part of the movement that demands no more barriers, denial or resistance, no more silence. While his leadership had a great influence on a wide scale, it was to survivors in particular that Anthony had such a profound effect. Phil from Ballarat told me that Anthony always lifted their spirits. He first met Anthony and Chrissy when the parliamentary inquiry went to Ballarat and when the word got out the Fosters had arrived, our spirits were lifted. Phil said that when Anthony asked, how are you, he actually wanted to know. He gave you time to talk. He was a mentor, teaching him how to deal with the press, how to be strong and how to keep our dignity. Phil said to me, Anthony taught me that you can stand up for yourself or get help to do it. Don't let them tell you what to do. Stand tall and fight. As a survivor, this was a game changer for me. So I did. I did stand up and fight back against them. And Phil's words about Anthony's impact on him would be exactly what so many more survivors would say. <clears throat> when Colm O'Gorman's book was published, Mary Robertson, at that time the President of the Republic of Ireland, said, 
Colm O'Gorman is one of the most inspiring and dignified voices in Ireland in recent times. I say Anthony Foster was one of the most inspiring and dignified voices in Australia in recent times. Thank you. Anthony's work is not finished, and there are many of us, too many of us, I can guarantee you, who will ensure that his legacy is honoured and fulfilled. My journey with Anthony and Chrissy Foster has been one which changed my life for the better. Anthony Foster was and is my inspiration. I will never forget him. Thank you. And I'd like to thank the musicians. All the music today has been chosen by Amy Foster. And thank you to John Van Ray, Tim Seckel and Anne Barker. Now with today's sporting news, Paul Ke Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> I'd like to invite Paul Kennedy, ABC News presenter, sports reporter, co-author with Chrissy of the book, and a friend to speak. And 
Paul will be followed by a reading from Chrissy's brother, Geoffrey Watt. Paul. Thank you, John. Thanks to all for coming here today. Um, I notice the dignitaries, the Premier, thank you for, for announcing the state funeral. Um, the former Premier is here and the, the former Attorney General who called for the parliamentary inquiry. There are many members of Parliament here today that gave very moving speeches yesterday in Parliament and the family was present for that. So we thank you very much and I note that the former Speaker Ken Smith is here. Ken was um, the man that uh, welcomed the book being brought to the parliamentary library and he along with other politicians back in the 1990s, a long time ago, started investigating the crimes against children and cover, and cover up. So, um, as well as the dignitaries, of course, I want to welcome everyone else here today. Many familiar faces that we've met over many years and a lot of unfamiliar faces. And I don't think even Chrissy and the family um, could quite comprehend the reach of Anthony's work. And uh, he would have loved that you're all here today. You would have loved the magnificence of this room, the beautiful music and, and everything that went along with it. I just want to give a few observations uh, about the man as I knew him. Anthony always gave the best greetings. He shook hands just the way my father said all men should. Stand up straight, firm grip, make eye contact. The first few times I shook his hand he was probably sizing me up. So it was all pretty standard, but that changed quickly as we got to know each other. Though his grip never softened, his eyes did, and his gift was always his smile. On momentous occasions, and there were many of those, he would decide a handshake was not good enough, and he'd pull me in for a hug. I never told him, but I secretly treasured those expressions of our friendship and mutual respect. He was my hero, after all. <clears throat> We met in Oakley in the mid-1990s. I was a cadet journalist covering a story of clergy sex abuse and cover-up. Chrissy and Anthony were parents among many who had too many questions. In trying to organise meetings with the church hierarchy and finances for their friends, neighbours and their beautiful daughters, the Fosters had already become leaders. Over the next 20 years, they would become two of the most courageous and empathetic leaders this country has known. TV viewers first saw the Fosters in 2002 on a 60-minute story, though they were in disguise. You may have seen some of that old footage on the Sunday just passed on a wonderful tribute given by 60 Minutes and Tara Brown. Years after that interview, Anthony and Chrissy looked back at their wigs and makeup, and they laughed. Chrissy was particularly bemused because she thought the producers made her look old enough to be Anthony's mother. <laughs> Another strength of their marriage has always been their ability to laugh together. In that 2002 story, the late Richard Carlton interviewed the Archbishop George Pell. I won't go into the details of this brilliant interview, save to mention one line. Richard was pointing to a legal document and insisting there was a sentence that clearly contradicted the church's position. And the journalist said, words have meaning, sir. Anthony liked that line and he quoted it to me often. Paul, words have meaning. Yes, they do. For evidence, go back and listen to any one of Anthony's interviews over the years from here to Rome. Listen to parts of the eulogy he gave at Emma's funeral, a speech that I can still feel almost a decade later. In 2010, as you just heard, uh, there was a book launch. Anthony was the MC that night of the book launch of Hell on the Way to Heaven, his family story. And for those of you who don't know, who haven't worked out by now, Anthony was the warmest and most generous host you could ever have, equalled only by Chrissy Foster. This night he was in top form, telling small jokes to put everyone at ease, lavishing his author wife with praise, as he always did, and she always did to him. She said to me last week that 10, 20, 30 years into their marriage, she used to say things to him like, I just can't get enough of you. There was plenty of love in the room that night. And when inviting her on stage, Anthony made, Anthony made the point that Chrissy was able to take all the troubling words and feelings that she had inside and put them on paper and that had been very good for her emotionally. And he added almost to himself, sometimes I wish I could do that. It made me realise how much he was suffering. Soon after, he told me that Chrissy's writing had inspired him 
and it was now his turn to be a voice for survivors and their families. We all know what happened next. With love and conviction, Anthony's quiet words of meaning shook the ground beneath the bluestone institutions of this country and finally called an end to the dreaded age of deference. Sitting alongside Anthony and Chrissy at the Royal Commission hearings was an experience I will always remember. They sat in on as many sessions as possible to bear witness in support of both friends and would-be friends. Leonie Sheedy from Clan told me last week she'll never forget the day that some testimony from a witness made her cry. She didn't know Anthony well at that point, but she saw him stand up across the aisle, kneel beside her and comfort her. The Fosters showed such tenderness more times than anyone can count. I had dinner with Chrissy and Anthony in Sydney after the last public hearing into the Catholic Church. It had been a gruelling and at times galling few weeks. The Fosters were exhausted, yet determined to finish what they started. There's still much work to do and Anthony would want me to remind those in power, those sitting in this room today and those watching on a live feed or watching it back later on, at state and Commonwealth levels, that the Royal Commission's recommendations must be acted upon. <laughs> Please do it without delay and without hearing any more from those people responsible for failing our children. I want to give thanks briefly to the commissioners and their staff, I know some of them are here today, for their tireless work and their kindness to the Fosters. I'm so grateful. <laughs> I am so grateful for Justice Peter McClellan's presence here today. You'll hear from him shortly. Anthony admired you so much. When I saw Anthony lying in hospital after his fall, I could not believe that my hero, a lion of the man, was going to die. My heart broke for Chrissy and her girls, Katie and Amy, and for everyone who knew him and needed him. The tributes these past two weeks have made it real. Journalist Tess Lawrence wrote that we have lost our own Atticus Finch, and that seemed to me a good comparison. I think my most lasting memory of Anthony will be the day we spent at the Fosters' beloved Gippsland bush property that you heard John speak about earlier. It was the day after Amy gave birth to Ivy, Anthony and Chrissy's second grandchild. They were very tired that day, but we had a good lunch. My wife Kim and I watched proudly our three sons playing with Ivy's older brother Leo. They were walking slowly after a friendly kangaroo that had stopped in to say hello. They were hoping to give him a pat. Anthony, it seemed that day, and on many occasions, was wonderful with my sons and treated them with such respect. And I'll always hold him up to them as the model of a true man. That day, we talked for a long time about the future. We wandered the garden. It was a beautiful day, perfect. At one point, standing beside a tree with the reddest leaves, a Japanese maple, Anthony put his grandson on his shoulders and they both started laughing aloud. That's the image that'll stay with me. May that little boy and his sister grow up to one day read about their wonderful grandfather and all he did for their generation, for the generations before them, and for many more generations of Australian children to come. Thank you. One of Anthony's beautiful daughters, Amy, has a book of the collected poems which she reads to her and Luke's little boy, Leo, at bedtime. Within its pages is a poem by Stephen Spender, which reminds Amy of her beautiful dad. I would like to share that with you today. I think continually of those who are truly great, who, from the womb, remembered the soul's history 
through corridors of light where the hours are suns, endless and singing, whose lovely ambition was that their lips, still touched with fire, should tell of the spirit clothed from head to foot in song, and who hoarded from the, bridge, from the spring branches the desires falling across their bodies like blossoms. What is precious is never to forget. The essential delight of the blood drawn from ageless springs breaking through rocks in worlds before our earth. Never to deny its pleasure in the morning's simple light nor its grave evening demand for love. Never to allow gradually the traffic to smother with noise and fog the flowering of the spirit. Near the snow, near the sun, in the highest fields, see how these names are fated by the waving grass and by the streamers of white cloud and whispers of wind in the listening sky. The names of those who in their lives fought for life, who wore at their hearts the fire's center. Born of the sun, they traveled a short while toward the sun and left the vivid air signed with their honor. What is precious is never to forget. Anthony loved family, he loved justice, and he loved helping others. We will never forget Anthony's love and what he achieved for others through that love. And we will never forget his beautiful soul that was, what, that was once such an integral part of our family but stayed for a time on this earth that was always going to feel too short. It was so precious to us. Thank you, Geoffrey. Thank you, Paul. And I now invite Anthony's daughters, Katie and Amy, and son-in-law, Luke, to offer the family tribute, please. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Thanks for always making me feel special. You were so smart, wise, and giving, and a generous man. Love always, Katie. Amy, you are the strongest woman I know. Your dad thought the world of his little girl. And I stand here proud to be part of this amazing family who I love very much. Anthony was a beautiful man. He created the most beautiful family, in particular his daughter, to whom is my wife, the most resilient woman I know. And together we stand here today saying goodbye to our very special husband, dad, father-in-law, and of course, granddad. You touched so many hearts, including my, fa including my family, who thought the world of you. I learned so much about the beautiful qualities. Anthony, you opened my eyes and guided me through many situations. I constantly watched the way you conducted yourself. It didn't matter the situation. You, it would seem like it was the right decision, no, no matter what the pressure you were faced. You spent so much time with our Leo, Ivy, and always had the time for them, no matter how busy your day was. The kids love you so much. 
This is a terrible tragedy and so difficult to understand. Understand why? But this is the way you but it is the way that you lived your life and your love for us that was so pure. Your desire to have a go will be so missed. Anthony, I promise I will look after the ones that you love so much. found it incredibly difficult to write something that I feel does justice to the wonderful man my father was. How can I sum up such noble qualities that were so incredibly vast and magic that lay in how he made others feel into mere words? Where can one begin to talk about a person so remarkable that those who knew him best, who spent the most time in his presence, never became accustomed to his greatness. My family and I were astonished ba daily by his genius, wisdom, patience and modesty. He was pure-hearted, forgiving, compassionate and never judgmental. While the public domain experienced his grace, tireless advocacy and the enormity of his integrity, the whole expanse of his beauty flourished behind closed doors. He was not a man who put his best face forward for the public arena. What he shared of his incredible self was just the tip of the iceberg. He read widely and never quit learning. He craved knowledge, never to lord over others or to boost his ego, but simply to feed his insatiable curiosity. While giving in material terms, this was the least remarkable element of his generous nature. He was liberal with his time, talents and allegiance to others. He prided himself on spreading himself thin, of giving himself benevolently to others. Most of all, he was generous with his love because he knew that this was where real value lied in giving love, warmth, empathy and kindness, he was aware that the soul would sing and incite the same in others. He was a man who knew what was truly precious and by having this deep understanding, he went above and beyond to create as much joy as possible amongst his family and friends. How much fun mum, dad, Katie, Luke, Leo, Ivy and I have had together all giddy with excitement in one another's presence. There were countless projects, happenings, and adventures to discuss, and it was difficult for any of us to get a word in over the other. Family was Dad's sole purpose, and his soul's purpose. He kept his loved ones close, and we were as thick as thieves. His eyes twinkled with the energy of his spirit, so full of life, joy and laughter. Endlessly he taught us how to be, never through righteousness or lecturing, but by simply and superbly being. Instead of the talking the talk, boy, did he walk the walk. He adored my mother, and when they were apart, it was evident how large a piece was missing, how incomplete that picture was. Strangely, I would sometimes see my parents as siblings in a way. How could these people so deeply entwined have ever been apart? A phenomenal father, he also oozed a maternal warmth that solidified into nurturing hugs, kisses, I love yous and adoring looks. Amongst the chaos of life, he'd stop to tell you how much you meant to him. He didn't fail my imaginings of how he'd be as a grandfather. It gave me immense joy to see him with my children every single time we met. He adored them both, and as they blossomed from babies into little people, 
It was plain to see how his heart melted. How happy his final years have been. He achieved so much in his last decade and it brings me great peace to know that he died having seen his dream fast realised. He enjoyed nine years of retirement in which he and mum travelled, endlessly socialised and enjoyed the fruits of their labour. They purchased a country property where he found great peace and an outlet for his boundless energy. He worked tirelessly to establish Katie in her own purpose-built home. He became a father-in-law, gaining the yearned for son he never had, and tirelessly worked with us to build our family home. Mum and Dad realised, attended and supported others through the groundbreaking Royal Commission. He encouraged me to attend a private hearing only a couple of months ago, something I would never have initiated for myself but which has turned out to be an indescribably healing experience. Along with Dad's exceptional intelligence and insight came great intuitiveness and sensitivity. I cannot begin to imagine how the horrific knowledge of his daughter's sexual abuse broke his heart, let alone the death of his firstborn baby and the irreparable injury sustained to his second. My father saved my life, and I'm sure countless others too. When he saw those tortured souls we all recognise, on the edge of society in various states of self-destruction, I don't doubt he saw his precious babies, children born pure and equal, full of hope and enormous human potential, only to be put upon by traumas endured and witnessed throughout life's journey by no fault of their own. Throughout unthinkable loss and grief, his spirit never ceased to blossom. How can one man have been so strong? Despite all, he kept on keeping on. He never turned to vices designed to numb, nor to rage or blame. Instead, he took his pain, turned it inside out and clutched tightly to empathy and justice. Regardless, his untimely death points to all that he endured. I am so fortunate to have been this rare man's daughter. What a privileged life I have had. You may rest in peace now, dear Dada. We will be okay because you showed us the way. We will continue to love, laugh and share. We are thoroughly better human beings for having had you in our lives. The foreman is down, but we will continue to climb those stairs. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, Amy, and Luke. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a musical interlude, and then Justice Peter McClellan will be the final speaker. Could I please implore you, if you haven't already checked your phone, could you just take a moment could we have no more phones ringing, please? Please, from this point on. Thank you.
Now, ladies and gentlemen, the Honourable Justice Peter McClellan is chair of the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse and has asked if he could make a tribute, and it is today's final tribute. Peter. Anthony Foster <coughs> leaves a legacy for all Australians. We can see his legacy in the changes which many institutions have made for the safety of children in their care. We can see it in the changes institutions are making in their response to survivors of abuse. More changes will certainly follow. The sexual abuse of a child is a terrible crime. It is perpetrated against the most innocent in our community. It strips the child of that innocence. It can and often does damage the child's ability to develop and live a happy and fulfilled life. It is the gravest of personal violations. The abuse of a child could not only damage that child, in many cases it, it inflicts trauma on the close relatives and friends of the child. The distress, anguish and sense of betrayal felt by the parents of a child who has been abused can never be fully appreciated other than by those who must suffer it. Can any of us who have not been in Anthony's and Chrissy's position imagine the sense of loss experienced by a parent who has entrusted their child to an institution only to find that a member of that institution has fundamentally betrayed that trust? Can we imagine the anger the parent feels when the abuser denies their crime? or the institution seeks to avoid responsibility for it. The Royal Commissioners have spoken with many parents who have struggled with their own trauma as they sought to assist their children to, to recover and live productive lives. Some parents carry unresolved anger. Understandably overcome by grief, their capacity to contribute to others' lives can be diminished. For some, their grief and anger becomes a motivating force to advocate for their own children and for all abused children. They seek a just response and they seek that institutions resolve to bring lasting change to ensure that other children will not suffer as their own have done. Anthony Foster was such a person. Anthony loved all of his children, a love he shared with Chrissy. The suffering which they experienced as a result of the abuse of Emma and Katie is documented in Chrissy's book, Hell on the Way to Heaven. Many people, quite understandably, would have been destroyed by that suffering. Many would have been overwhelmed by what they saw as the uncaring response of an institution to the needs of their children. But Anthony with Chrissy did not let this happen. Instead, they resolved to devote their lives to both care for their own children and to advocate for all children who may have been abused. After Anthony had given evidence before the Royal Commission and we had reported in relation to the Melbourne response, I came to know him at a personal level. In every conversation I had with Anthony, his central concern was for the welfare of others. In his quiet and articulate way, he talked to me of his, of his concerns that institutions and all of their leaders should accept that terrible events had happened. And he was determined to do what he could to ensure that institutions and government made an appropriate and just response. 
Others have documented Anthony's contribution to the decision to hold the Victorian parliamentary inquiry. This was of course followed by the decision by all of the governments in Australia to create a national royal commission. Anthony knew when pressing for these inquiries that the needs of those who had been sexually abused as children extended far beyond his immediate family. He understood that unless the resources of a national inquiry were employed, there was little chance that the Australian community would come to understand what had occurred. No doubt there were some, perhaps many, who thought that the Royal Commission was not necessary. Anthony knew otherwise. Anthony understood that the sexual abuse of children was a whole of community issue. He believed that crimes had been committed against children by many people in many institutions across Australia. He believed that those institutions had put their reputations before the welfare of children. He believed they had covered up to avoid scandal. He believed that they had failed by breaching the fundamental trust that the community's parents had placed in them. Whilst caring for their own family, Anthony, together with Chrissy, devoted their lives to seeking justice for all victims. They spent countless days at Royal Commission hearings. They participated in our round tables. They provided us with considered submissions. They were always caring and thoughtful for others. Inasmuch as the Royal Commission has been tasked with bearing witness to the suffering of children who have been abused, Anthony, with Chrissy, accepted an obligation to bear witness on behalf of all survivors. There were many occasions during our public hearings when some of those present were overcome by their own memories or the grief carried by others. Anthony was always alert to their suffering and ready to provide a comforting word or gentle embrace. Many have directly felt the warmth of the, the acknowledgement from someone who truly understood their pain. Anthony and Chrissy attended our public hearings so often, it was not a surprise that when our hearings were coming to an end, they came from Melbourne to take their usual place in the room. Anthony will remain in the memory of all the commissioners and commission staff. There are many others who have walked beside him. They have been encouraged, supported and inspired by Anthony. Anthony was a loving and good man. He was gentle, courageous and caring. Anthony's legacy will be realised by a just response for all those who were abused in an institution. This must include a commitment by the Australian community that these terrible crimes should never happen again. Thank you, Your Honour, and I suspect it would be one of Anthony's greatest regrets that he won't be around to read your report in much the same way as, for instance, Eddie Marbo was not around to find out about the High Court decision on that significant anniversary as well. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, to all of our speakers today for sharing remarkable memories of a remarkable man and from so many different perspectives. Could you join me please in thanking Jane Summers, the Amati Strings and Liam Butler Webb for their beautiful performances.
Our service will shortly conclude. I'd ask that you just take some time to allow the immediate family and the official party to depart the hall, and then you're welcome to join on Sturt Street at the side to say a final farewell to Anthony as the casket leaves. On behalf of Chrissy, Katie, Amy, all of Anthony's family, I'd like to pass on their thanks to the Premier for his offer of a state funeral for Anthony, to the various representatives of all the different parts of politics and public life, people who have been crucial in decision-making along this journey, not all of whom can be or need to be named. Many of you are here today. And everybody who is here to express their love and gratitude for this truly remarkable man, Anthony Foster. Thank you. Tiro. 